participating online, please just contact us, info at bad gut, and we will be happy to send it out to you. These pamphlets we distribute, about 550,000 of these pamphlets now across the country. So physicians order them and then they hand them out to their patients uh, uh, on, on all these whole range of topics. We have a newsletter, it is a subscription to that. The samples are out there as I mentioned, and that's $20 per year. So if you wanna participate in that, please sign up. Uh, but here's the thing, is that we're really about giving free information to patients as much as we can. So we have a bunch of lectures in the community, as I mentioned last week, and we have one at the end of the month on irritable bowel syndrome and the FODMAP diet, which is uh, something that's become very popular for irritable bowel syndrome, completely different uh, condition from inflammatory bowel disease. But since we do cover all those areas, we offer those topics as well. So um, please engage with us on our social media. And now I'd just like to transition right into watching the video. And I think the tech folks have got it all set up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans. And this is a brief overview of a disease that attacks our guts called inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. It is actually not a single disease, but rather refers primarily to two I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and this is a brief overview of a disease that attacks our guts called inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. It is actually not a single disease, but rather refers primarily to two related but distinct diseases. One is called Crohn's disease, and the other is called ulcerative colitis, or UC. The key differences are firstly the location of the inflammation, and secondly, the extent of the inflammation. Ulcerative colitis only affects the colon or large intestine, while Crohn's disease can affect the entire digestive system, from the mouth to the anus, or as we say, from gum to bum. In ulcerative colitis, inflammation only involves the inner lining, or what we call the mucosa, while in Crohn's disease, inflammation can extend right through the entire thickness of the bowel wall to the outermost layer of the digestive tract. These differences lead to different outcomes and different treatments, which I'll get to later. The major symptoms of UC and Crohn's do, however, overlap. These include stomach pain and a change in bowel habits. Almost always this means more urgent movements. Other symptoms include weight loss, decreased appetite, uh, fever, night sweats, and extreme tiredness. Now these are trademark symptoms, but it's very important to remember that IBD can play out quite differently in different people. The symptoms of IBD can come and go over long periods of time. Now, people may experience periods of severe symptoms, or what we call flare-ups, and also go through periods when they have few or no symptoms at all, what we call remission. IBD can occasionally affect or inflame other parts of your body, such as your eyes, your skin, your liver, your joints. Now, other symptoms can be more specific. For example, because UC only affects the inner lining of the bowel, we tend to see mucus and blood in the stool, whereas Crohn's can inflame the whole bowel wall. So there may be blood, but also significant abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. Both diseases can lead to growth delay in children. To investigate the cause of your symptoms or, or gauge the extent of your disease, your care team will listen to your story, ask if there is any family history, and then investigate with things like blood tests, stool samples, and then likely examination of your bowel through x-rays, scans, and their scopes uh, to look at the inside of your bowel. IBD is usually diagnosed in young people, say 15 to 25, but it can appear at any time. There is slightly increased risk for those who have a family member with a condition, and IBD is more common in white people and more prevalent among Jewish people of European origin. IBD affects about 1 in 350 people in most nations, but it's more common in northern regions. Here in Canada, we actually have the highest rate in the world, with IBD occurring in as many as 1 in 150 persons, which translates to about 230,000 Canadians. We're not exactly sure why Crohn's and UC happens, it appears that some sort of environmental factor in susceptible individuals causes the immune system, the body's defense against infection, to malfunction. The immune system then starts attacking healthy tissue inside the digestive system, leading to the inflammation. Currently, there is no cure for IBD, but many of the treatments that are effective target the immune system. So medications such as corticosteroids or 5-ASAs, which help reduce inflammation, or immunosuppressants are often used. Medicines called biologics have become a key treatment option for those with moderate to severe inflammatory bowel disease. 
They work by using specially developed antibodies to selectively block the effects of the molecules that are involved in the inflammation of the gut wall. The idea here is that we can move from beyond just symptom management and heal the mucosal lining, which can lead to remission and prevent relapses. In Crohn's disease, mild attacks result in patches of inflammation in the lining of the intestine with groups of small ulcers, similar to mouth ulcers that can occur anywhere in the digestive tract. However, in moderate or severe Crohn's disease, these ulcers become much larger and deeper with a lot of surrounding redness. The inflammation can make the intestine become thickened, blocking the passage of digested food. In some cases, deep ulcers break through the wall of the intestine, causing infection outside the bowel, what we call an abscess. And this can actually spread to the skin or a nearby part of the body, what we call a fistula. About three out of four patients with Crohn's will require surgery at one point to remove an inflamed section of the digestive system, especially if the inflammation has caused a blockage. Fortunately now, our surgical techniques have become much less invasive than in the past. Surgery is sometimes necessary in UC, but with early treatment, it can often be avoided. Things to think about with the diet are pretty common sense and individualized. There's considerable variation from person to person, so self-awareness about what foods set you off or, or work for you can be very helpful, as is staying hydrated. Self-awareness is also important when it comes to managing stress. The unpredictability of IBD or, or dealing with symptoms at the same time you're dealing with life's other stressors can be incredibly tricky to navigate. Inflammatory bowel disease can have a profound effect on an individual's life, physically, emotionally, and socially both at home and at school, or in the workplace. Having to go to the washroom more than 10 times a day, or, or even talking about your bowels, is, uh, you know, I think it's challenging at any age, but perhaps especially as a young person when this disease commonly strikes. It's a disease that often impacts families, not just individuals, and it is a journey that requires no small amount of bravery, problem solving, and optimism. Although there is no cure yet, uh, there are many treatment options available. As one of my patients with IBD said to me, with my ups and downs, it was important for me to remember that things will return to normal. It may be a new normal, but normal just the same. There are some fantastic IBD resources out there to educate, learn, and share with others that are where you are or have already been there. Thanks for listening and take care. Thank you, Jim. Um, I thank Gail for uh, preparing you all for this uh, presentation. Okay. So what I'm going to start off with um, is just a recap of uh, the sort of incidence of IBD throughout the world. This is what's known as a heat map. And I think uh, what was evident in the introduction is that there are these industrialized portions of a world where IBD is very common. And so in Canada, there are about 14,000 cases diagnosed each year. And about half a percent of the population have these uh, disorders collectively. About 50-50 split with perhaps Crohn's disease making the, the majority of the uh, cases uh, that we see here in Canada. Now, in terms of uh, looking at these diseases, I really I enjoyed the video. And I think it's important to stress that when we have drugs, in the past we had steroids, now we have biologic agents, which have been a wonderful uh, addition to the armamentarium that we possess to treat patients with IBD. Because when I started, all we had was steroids and we had surgery. So if I can just take you through this fairly briefly, this is what we call digestive damage, and I'll explain that in a second. This is inflammatory activity. So if we look across this sort of you know, time course, we see our patients at these type of uh, intervals when they have a flare, and in between, they're perfectly well. 
but unbeknownst to the patient and us, and you know, until the last uh, probably decade or decade and a half, there is this ongoing progressive damage in the gut. So patients will have strictures causing blockage, pain, vomiting. They can have fistulae and abscesses, and these can be horrendous. Abscesses are acute perforation type of presentations where patients will present to hospital with fever and pain. And the fistulae can be anywhere. They can go from the gut to other portions of the bowel, to the skin, to the perianal region, to the bladder, to the spine, pretty much anywhere, because it is a transmural process. And eventually patients end up having surgery and the whole cycle repeats itself. So what we're really looking for here is drugs that will retard the progression of the disease. And we are recognizing that even though biologics have been around for probably over a couple of decades now, we're not able to impact on this any great or meaningful manner. We're probably able to retard it slightly. Now, all I want you to see here is inflammation. This is a slide that I've been using to teach medical students and residents for a long time. But essentially, as per the last cartoon presentation, what we're dealing with is a couple of important cells, macrophages, which when they're activated, produce something called TNF. This has been a surprising target in this area, rheumatology and psoriasis, because just by targeting this one molecule, we've been able to achieve really a, a monumental change or shift in management of patients with IBD. You know, they no longer have the horrible symptoms they used to have. So it's important to bear in mind. We knew early on that interleukin-12, which is another inflammatory marker, that is a really important mediator of what we call polarization of lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are very useful cells to have in the gut, as evidenced by things called T regulatory cells, or they can be nasty, Th1 or Th2. And for a long time, we've recognized that Th1, which produce gamma interferon, Th2, which produce interleukin-13, these are the two baddies. And more recently, we've recognized that interleukin-23 is a baddie too. So we have been targeting this and this and this. And all these drugs that have actually targeted these agents are now coming into clinical uh, sort of presence. We are able to use these in patients. Some of you here may have actually been involved in clinical trials targeting these particular molecules. One really surprising one is this thing called SMAD7. So TGF-beta is like a break on the immune system. If some inflammation runs rampant throughout your gut, this is a sort of a break that tries to dampen things down. And so what investigators learned early on was that there's this inhibitor of this pathway that switched on. So if you target that, if you can get rid of that inhibitor, you will allow TGF-beta to sort of work effectively and again, dampen the immune system. So there is an exciting oral compound which is coming through in clinical studies that we think will or could potentially radically change management again. So this is an example of what we never saw before that we could see with these anti-TNF agents. So on the left is a pretty nasty looking bowel with big, deep, sort of serpiginous ulcers. And if you look at the dates, May 3rd, June 21st, after a couple of doses, this is from a very uh, you know, a notable center in uh, Leuven, Belgium. They did a lot of the pioneering work in this area. It looks much improved. So this was quite a shift in terms of how we manage these diseases. So if we look at all the targets out there, anti-TNF, a bad molecule, interleukin-12 and 23, they share a common subunit. So if we target that common subunit, we can actually target both of these nasty things. And this is, the data on this agent is going to be presented this year, or has already been presented, and looks very promising too. And then if we look at the anti sort of integrins, and I didn't talk about these, but if you can think about it, lymphocytes are bad cells, they produce bad chemicals, they produce a lot of damage. So if you can not only inhibit the mediators that cause the damage, but also influx of these uh, particular cells into the gut, then you can actually achieve quite worthwhile results. And the data there was actually known to us about two and a half decades ago, that if you did that in animal models, this would work. And again, this is Antivio. Some of you may have come across it. This is a monoclonal antibody that works really well. So 
People who fail anti-TNFs, this is the next step. We will probably end up using this or this. So this is a sort of a hierarchy of treatment that is going to need some sort of sorting out over the next sort of a few years. Over here, we've got other sort of members of the inflammatory pathway, which I didn't go into. They're sort of newer agents. They're also proving to be quite promising. SMAD7 I've talked about. And there's another one, sphingosine 1-phosphate. So this is an interesting one, because what happens with this particular compound is that instead of preventing the lymphocytes migrating into the gut, this particular compound, and things like this have been used in MS favorably, this actually kind of sequesters all the lymphocytes. They're kind of trapped. As one of the gastroenterologists uh, put it quite nicely at a meeting last year, it's like Hotel California. You kind of, you know, you get into it, but you can't get out, never get out. So it's very interesting. And the red sort of, you know, asterisks demark the ones we've either been involved with or are currently involved in sort of, you know, trials at the moment. So we're actually looking at all these compounds. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sowell. Uh, there'll be a little question afterwards if you can remember all those um, things, you get a prize. <laughs> Our third speaker, um, Dr. Fergal Donlan, is, uh, is a, a very skilled endoscopist, very skilled uh, practitioner, and uh, an assistant professor in the uh, Department of Gastroenterology at Vancouver General Hospital. He has a special interest in therapeutics. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. But he's not talking about that, though. He's going to talk about uh, gastroenterology. Dr. Donlan, thank you. <laughs> uh, hello. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to change things a little bit. I, I've been practicing here now for, oh, how long have you been here, Jim? 30 years? I've been here four years. And what has struck me the most about the difference between here and Newfoundland, where I'm from, no, I'm actually Irish, I'm from <laughs> Ireland, uh, yes, is when I see patients with inflammatory bowel disease, one of their main focus, focus or their main focus is on what can I eat? And it struck me a, a little bit. So I thought I would make it reasonably basic. I know Dr. Saul is the scientist in our group and he has all the drugs with the funny names. I'm gonna talk very basic. So basically, can food cause IBD? Anyone think so? No? So currently there's no clear evidence that food or food add additives directly causes IBD. What about can food cure IBD? Well, you probably read a lot of things in magazines and diet sheets that a number of different diets claim to cure IBD, but the majority don't have sufficient clinical evidence, which means in clinical trials, um, they haven't been shown to support this claim. Some people do find that certain foods make uh, trigger off their symptoms make their symptoms worse. And some people find that there are no particular triggers at all. What about specific diets you hear about? Um, hands up who's heard about this, the low FODMAP diet, yeah. So I know Gail originally uh, had, had said something about it earlier. Most research on this has been done on irritable bowel syndrome rather than inflammatory bowel disease. Um, in IBS, it's useful for treating bloating and diarrhea but it has not been shown to be useful in treating active disease in inflammatory bowel disease. And if one is considering this, so if you read something in a magazine, um, liaising with some of your friends or colleagues to say, I felt better once I went on this low FODMAP diet, it's important you would liaise with your gastroenterologist, family doctor, or more importantly, with a dietitian, because this is a low calorie diet. It's a restrictive diet, so it can end up uh, um, with some malnourishment or the potential of malnourishment. What about this specific carbohydrate diet? Anyone heard of this? Yeah. So this was a diet, it's interesting, it was from a pediatrician in the 50s in the US, um, had originally introduced it for celiac disease, which is the gluten allergy uh, that the Irish and the Celtic people brought to Canada, but don't hold that against us. <laughs> And uh, there was a, a woman that brought her daughter, I believe, down to this pediatrician down in the US who had very severe ulcerative colitis. And this pediatrician instituted this specific carbohydrate diet, which is a very low carbohydrate diet. It's quite restrictive. And the person got better. And this led to the, uh, this 
patient's mother publishing a book uh, saying that this was a, um, a very good diet, a specific carbohydrate diet for uh, ulcerative colitis. Again, we live now in a medicine is changing. Everything is evidence-based, although we may find, we feel in our gut, pardon the pun, as physicians that something works. Unless we show in a clinical trial, um, we cannot really endorse it. So there's no conclusive evidence that the specific carbohydrate diet works. Again, I'm not saying not to use it or not to try it, but again, important, it is a rather restrictive diet and can lead to nutritional deficiencies. So it's important to liaise with a dietitian prior to considering this as an adjunct rather than as a whole treatment. What about other diets? Well, anyone heard of this anti-inflammatory diet for IBD? This is a new diet out. Um, again, quite restrictive. And there is some evidence, limited evidence, that it can improve things as a, in association with medical or pharmaceutical treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. Paleo, I never heard of this until I came to Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> I presume 99% of people here do CrossFit. No? <laughs> so again, paleo diet is important. Omega-3 enriched diet. I'm trying to, uh, and a vegetarian diet. Again, useful adjuncts, but important to seek um, the uh, a dietitian or dietary advice before, before starting this. Lactose intolerance, I just thought I'd, I'd say this because I, I have a lot of people come in and say, oh, what's the whole deal with lactose intolerance and, and inflammatory bowel disease? Um, most probably know this, it's a deficiency in uh, the enzyme lactase, which digests lactose. And there has been some re research showing that people with Crohn's disease can have acquired lactose intolerance rather than ulcerative colitis, because Crohn's, as it previously stated, can affect anywhere from we, I, I've never heard that gum to bum. I say mouth to anus, um, but anus is a European <laughs> word, I would think. Is that right, Jim? Can I use the word anus in <laughs> Canada? It, hopefully, it doesn't matter. Most people don't understand what I say, so even if this is recorded. <laughs> um, again, you should, should cons one should consider lactose intolerance if symptoms with dairy products, bloating, gas, wind, diarrhea. There are a no number of alternatives out there, but it's important that dairy has a lot of good stuff in it, calcium and vitamin D. So if, if one is considering with inflammatory bowel disease, if you think you have lactose intolerance, to always supplement your diet with calcium and vitamin D. And, uh, and my old mentor always used to say, is there a test for lactose intolerance? There is. My old mentor just used to say, don't drink milk. Uh, what about fiber? So there are two types of fiber, soluble and insoluble. Soluble is, um, is fully digested, resulting in a gel-like substance. So it slows down movement. So it's quite useful in episodes of diarrhea. Uh, important things, peeled fruit and veg. So it's the apple rather than the skin. And uh, a very important source of fiber, which is available in all good pharmacies in Canada, is Metamucil or psyllium husk. What about insoluble fiber? Well, this, as I said, is the skin rather than the core of the fruit. It's not digested. It adds more bulk to stools, but it's important that it can cause bloating and pain. And in some people with ulcerative colitis, if they over or take too much fiber, uh, it can add to the urgency of their bowel movements. And it's also those people who have Crohn's disease and may end up with small bowel strictures or narrowings in the bowel. The surgeon or the gastroenterologist or physician will all often say a low residue or a low fiber diet. And it's usually insoluble fibers because these tend to get stuck or the theory is they get stuck at the strictures or the narrowings. So I, I've told you what you cannot eat. Uh, what about what you can eat? Well, there, there's the eight, the eat well plate. And I must say this is uh, from the UK picture. Obviously being Irish, I would never uh, put this slide up at home or I would be crucified. Um, so that's a, a useful, the eat well plate. Probiotics, the bane of our existence. Isn't that right, Dr. Gray? We've all become uh, experts on probiotics overnight. So what is a probiotic? It's a live organism that when ingested in adequate amounts, exerts a health benefit to the host. My God, what a specific statement. Um, 
So the evidence from some clinical trials is supportive of the use of probiotics in irritable bowel syndrome. You know, it's good again for bloating, for gas, things like that. But it's important to remember that probiotics are strain specific and effects of one cannot be adapted to another. Um, and what do I mean by, well, what about probiotics and IBD? So clinical evidence is not convincing for probiotics as a treatment by themselves for active inflammatory bowel disease. There is no evidence whatsoever to support the use in treatment of Crohn's disease, but can be used as an adjunct. Now, I'm not saying probiotics shouldn't be used or you shouldn't take probiotics. I'm saying for active inflammatory bowel disease, there's no clinical evidence, so clinical trials to support the use. There is limited evidence to support the use of treatment in Crohn's, but this is limited to only a few studies. This is Mutaflor. And this is interesting, I'll just tell you a little side bit. Uh, this is a, a non-pathogenic, so a non-disease-causing E. coli. So you've all heard of E. coli. So this is an E. coli. And this was named after a uh, German dude, or a physician. And he had the distinct pleasure of treating who, Dr. Gray? German dude, turn of the century. Adolf Hitler. Yeah, he had IBS, yeah. Yeah, so this is the probiotic that used to, that Adolf, Adolf, I used to say Adolf, but Adolf since I've come to Canada. So there's a question, fun fact. Uh, now, where do probiotics in inflammatory bowel disease come in? So there is this condition called pouchitis. So some people with ulcerative colitis will end up with what we call a pouch to restore. So after they have their colon out, they still poop out their rear end, bottom bum, anus, um, through this thing called a pouch. And sometimes the pouch can inflame. And uh, there is evidence to support the use of VSL number three, which is a probiotic uh, that's useful uh, in pouchitis. It is quite expensive. Um, and I often tell people to order off the website if they're going to use it because you can get a little cheaper. So what about should you start a probiotic? Well, if I always give people or advise people that if you are, it's uh, important to start a food and symptom diary before you begin using probiotics. Keep a track of how you feel before and after, and then stop the probiotic after a month or so and monitor the response because they are costly. There's no point, point continuing something where the only benefit is it is your wallet is lighter. So what about some take home messages? Well, it's, I think it's important that you liaise, particularly with a dietitian. I think we, we have a very good GI dietitian yeah, at Vancouver General uh, before starting one of these particular diets, the low FODMAP, the SCD, the anti-inflammatory, uh, the paleo. Uh, most diets have not been scientifically proven to prevent or treat. Uh, some diets may increase the risk of nutritional deficiency, okay? Uh, and diet should not replace medical treatment. What about probiotics? Again, sorry, they haven't been shown, but it's, I'm not saying that one shouldn't try. They can be used as an adjunct, but always beware of the cost. Okay, there's no point, as one says, flogging a dead horse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Donald. It's always fun, you know, it's all in the family and we can talk about poo and bums and things like that. It's kind of a, so it's all polite and okay to talk about that. So anus or bum. Our third, our fourth speaker, Dr. Ted Steiner, is uh, a professor of medicine in the Department of Infectious Disease. He has a very special interest in um, C. difficile infection and uh, is a pioneer in management of that and treatment of that uh, in Vancouver and in Canada. So. Ted, it's a pleasure to speak. And just to put a plug in, there is a video coming out on bad gut uh, on uh, C. difficile that uh, might be of interest to you. And so, Ted, tell us what your story about C. diff. Thanks. So I'm not a gastroenterologist. I don't play one on TV. I, I, I'm, I'm a frustrated non-gastroenterologist because I love what they do, and then I think inflammatory bowel disease is fascinating. But I ended up in infectious diseases. To, uh, to take care of people with HIV who used to get sick and now don't, fortunately. So I hope that we'll have equivalent success with other diseases. 
Um, so, um, we, you know, if you talk to the general public and say, oh, I have a C. difficile infection with diarrhea, people are going to laugh and think, oh, it's, you know, it's uh, something to laugh at. But um, in fact, oh, I'm pointing this in the wrong place. Um, it's actually a, a major problem. C. difficile is a severe infection. How many people in the audience have heard of C. diff? Okay, the majority of you. Hopefully not from personal experience and maybe from what you've read, but if, if it is from personal experience, then you have my sympathy because it's a rotten thing. And in fact, in IBD, there's a vicious cycle with C. difficile. Um, so in general, C. diff, what we call C. difficile infection, is an infection that develops when people get the C. diff bacteria into their gut by eating other people's poop, basically, or uh, in fact, by eating animal poop, because C. diff is found in um, farm animals as well. Um, but normally, um, it'll pass, it'll stay there for a few days, maybe a few weeks, but the what we call the commensal bacteria, the normal healthy bacteria that fill your intestine will, will prevent C. diff from growing. Um, but when you don't have uh, the right intestinal bacteria, then C. diff can grow. Um, when that happens, it produces these toxins called toxin A and toxin B, cleverly named, uh, that lead to tremendous inflammation in the colon. And this causes symptoms that actually can be indistinguishable from IBD. So they can cause diarrhea, severe abdominal pain, bloating in uh, the most severe cases are fatal. Um, the problem is that if you have IBD to start with and then you get C. diff, you have trouble shutting off inflammation as, as Dr. Saul talked about. There's this ongoing inflammation in IBD. And part of the problem is that when you get an insult that your immune system is trained to fight like an infection, if you have IBD, you're not very good at, at shutting that off afterwards. It's like um, sending the, the troops in and then leaving them there uh, to continue to do damage. Um, so patients with IBD who develop C. diff infection can get a flare of their disease, or if their disease is already active, it can become worse. Um, another problem is that people with active um, IBD also already have an abnormal bacterial population in the colon and to some extent in the, in the small bowel. C. diff is normally disease just of the colon. It's rare cases where it can go up into the small intestine. But if you have ulcerative colitis, you have abnormal bacterial populations there. And some people are actually missing the bacteria that you need to fight off C. diff. And so people with IBD are more vulnerable to, to C. diff infection. Also, sometimes we, we actually use antibiotics to treat certain complications of IBD, and those antibiotics can also further affect bacteria and lead to um, risk for C. diff. Um, so as a result, treating and preventing C. diff in patients with IBD is a huge challenge. Um, and uh, some of my colleagues, uh, both here in Vancouver uh, and around the world, are focusing specifically on this question. So um, this is uh, the real sign of C. difficile. This is called pseudomembranous colitis. And what you see here is um, the inside of a colon that's filled with um, uh, inflamed mucosa. That's these red areas, lots of inflammation. And then these white patches here that are described as, as spattering cream colored paint on a red wall. And those patches there are called pseudomembranes. So they're not actual membranes that come off, but they're ulcers and inflammatory tissue that you can sort of scrape away and leave a bleeding mucosa. So you can imagine if this is what the inside of your colon looks like, how unpleasant and painful that could be. Um, so I, um, have a number of different research projects involved in C. diff and in IBD, and I'm just going to kind of go through those a little bit just to give you an understanding of some of what's going on uh, at VCHRI. So um, one of the projects that I'm most excited about these days is measuring and characterizing immune responses to C. diff in people with C. diff and also people with IBD. Um, we're looking specifically at T cells, which are the immune cells that we think um, create a lot of the damage in IBD but uh, they also help protect you against infections. And it's been very difficult in the past to figure out um, what the, the T cell responses to bacteria are. And so um, with uh, my main collaborator, Megan Levings, who's an uh, immunologist at Children's Hospital, we've been looking at a lot of patient samples and characterizing the type of T cells that uh, people develop when they have C. diff. Um, we're using this same methodology to study responses to a different protein called flagellin in people with IBD. Uh, flagellin, if, if any of you saw it, was actually on Dr. Saul's slide. It's a protein that bacteria make to swim and 
It also is recognized by the immune system um, as a way that they can tell when bacteria are present where they're not supposed to be. Um, and then there's a third feature of flagellin is that it's actually an important target of antibodies in the immune system and specifically in people with Crohn's disease. So there have been some very good studies out of the US showing that about half of people with Crohn's disease have antibodies to bacterial flagellins, um, but you don't see that those same levels in people with ulcerative colitis or people without IBD. You do see them in, in a few other rare conditions. So we've been looking at that and trying to figure out why that happens by looking at the T cells behind this. And this is a project that's ongoing with in, in collaboration with Dr. Saul, with gastroenterologists at St. Paul's as well. Um, uh, and we're just gearing up now to start recruiting uh, more subjects, more volunteers to give blood just to see what these responses look like. Um, I'm also doing a, a number of studies looking at new ways to prevent or treat C. difficile infection. So there's a worldwide trial of a new C. diff vaccine that's, um, uh, that I'm one site of at uh, VCHRI and uh, Fraser Health has a second site, but there's sites all over the world. So that's a study that's going to go on for a long time, basically seeing if this vaccine works. Um, I'm involved in some studies that are going to start shortly looking at new antibiotics to treat C. diff and whether they have an advantage over the current treatments we have. And then finally, I'm doing a lot of work on stool transplant, which is basically taking poop from a healthy person and giving it to someone with C. diff. So um, right now, stool transplant seems to be the most effective way to cure people with C. diff who've gone through multiple relapses. So they get C. diff, they get better, and then it comes back, and then they get better again, and then it comes back. There are a lot of people who can't get off of treatment for it, and stool transplant is very effective in those. Um, it's, uh, it's still considered sort of experimental, but um, there are provincial guidelines for use of stool transplant and C. diff that are being reviewed right now. And you may find by the end of the year, if not sooner, that this is a treatment that your doctor can provide or, or send you to someone close by who can do the procedure for you. Right now it's limited to C. diff, um, but there are clinical trials going on in IBD. There's one in ulcerative colitis in Hamilton, Ontario, um, and I, there are some um, trials going on in Alberta and also in uh, China So uh, and in the U.S. So there's a lot of interest in the possibility of using stool transplant to, to treat or cure IBD, but right now it's very preliminary. Um, and the patients I've seen who've had IBD and C. diff that I've used stool transplant on, some of them have indeed gotten better, but some of them have actually flared and their IBD has gotten worse. So that's been reported in the literature too. So it's something that I, I, we have to approach with caution. It's also potentially a really exciting new, new field. Um, then the last project I have that's funded by Crohn's Colitis Canada is looking at uh, very early work to try to develop T cell based immune therapy for IBD. In other words, we would take your T cells out and isolate the regulatory T cells, the ones that instead of causing inflammation, fight inflammation. And we would manipulate those cells in the lab so that they get turned on by flagellin, which is in the gut, and then put them back in your bloodstream. They would migrate to the gut and then dampen inflammation. So again, very early work, but very exciting work. And we're hoping that this leads potentially to a new treatment uh, for Crohn's and or colitis. Um, so I, I mentioned some of the, what I found is that patients with C. diff do have very high levels of T cells recognizing the toxins, especially if you're sicker. Um, and that stool transplant is a safe and effective treatment for C. diff. And I think it's almost become standard treatment. Um, but I mentioned it's very challenging in people with IBD, and uh, I think you really need to consult with an expert and weigh all the pluses and minuses uh, before considering with that, uh, going with that. And of course, this is our ultimate goal for everybody. <laughs> I just found that actually last week, believe it or not. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ted. That's very exciting to see the progress because um, obviously C. diff is a big problem. I just draw your attention to a survey that's on www.badgut.org that's in process right now to, to survey uh, anonymously people's experience with C. difficile. So I'd encourage you to go to the site. There's a, it's quite easy to navigate badgut.org and, and uh, find the uh, survey on C. diff and, and fill it out and sort of allows to share. It gives some information that we can use to to uh, support further initiatives. 
It's a pleasure to introduce our final speaker. We've heard enough from doctors, and now we're going to hear from Ms. Mavreen David, who's going to speak about her experience and journey with her inflammatory bowel disease. And so you're going to hear from the real goods rather than doctors about this. So, Mavreen, thank you very much for coming. I was worried you might not be able to see me vertically challenged. <laughs> But I can see you, so you can see me. <laughs> Just totally nerve wracking right now. <laughs> okay. okay, in preparation for this presentation, I spent a couple of hours looking through old albums and envelopes of photographs, um, searching for one image of myself in the hospital or an image from the time I experienced my first and arguably my worst Crohn's flare up. But I didn't find one. And while I recall there being at least one single photograph of me at Children's Hospital, that seems to have disappeared. I was 14 years old, spending a week in hospital receiving blood transfusions due to severe anemia. My colon was inflamed, ulcerated, and bleeding profusely. I recall that one particular photo because I was meeting Cliff Ronning of the Vancouver Canucks. He was visiting the teen ward that day, and um, this was back when the Canucks were a winning team, and so it was pretty exciting at the time. Um, but it was one of the few times I allowed my mom to photograph me when I was really sick. It's actually very fitting that the photo has gone missing, because during that first flare, I quite literally disappeared. I went from a chubby, healthy kid down to uh, skin and bone, an anemic 76-pound shell of myself. Um, my battle with Crohn's disease began at the age of 12. The disease ravaged my body and dimmed my spirit. Um, but over the last 26 years, I have managed to cope. Um, I have battled through illness, and I have learned to thrive despite this awful disease. As a preteen and teenager suffering from Crohn's disease, I was predictably shy about it all. Um, I don't know many people that feel comfortable talking openly about their abnormal and scary bowel movements, and I certainly wasn't any different. Um, it was terrifying to see blood and mucus in a toilet bowl, and forgive me for my crudeness, but uh, this is the reality for those of us with inflammatory bowel disease. I mean, with some of the stuff that's been said tonight, that doesn't seem so crude anymore, right? Um, uh, not to mention pain and urgency to run to the bathroom at any given moment. Um, you know, these are some of the symptoms that you're starting to hear about now that these diseases are getting some attention. But there are so many more. Um, I've created a timeline of my experience with Crohn's disease in order to give you a picture of what it's like to have a chronic illness we hear statistics of diagnosis, um, but what follows that initial discovery is often kind of overlooked. So, at 12 years old, I had my first flare-up. Um, it was a bowel flare-up and it was an arthritis flare-up. I had a swollen wrist that I had uh, fractured the year before. Um, and the arthritis attacked that weak joint. And I had kind of a wobbly hip that we didn't understand what was going on. It was a healthy, active 12-year-old that suddenly, you know, hobbled like my grandparents. Um, I couldn't get it under control. I saw gastroenterologists and rheumatologists. And the rheumatologist at some point just said, listen, I can't get your joints under control until your gut is under control. Um, and at that point, my parents um, moved me to the gastroenterologist at Children's Hospital. Um, I spent two years kind of in and out of hospital, doing all the different testing. And uh, at the age of 14, I finally got a certain diagnosis of, well, as certain as they can be, a diagnosis of Crohn's disease at the time. Um, Children's Hospital is phenomenal. The physicians there are are amazing as is their nursing support staff. And because of the bedside manner and the attention and, and the, um, the consideration of the vulnerability of children, I think that they were able to get to a diagnosis there with me because I was so afraid and hesitant um, at the other specialists, just did not want to 
you know, comply with anything, didn't want to take medications, didn't want to do any of the testing. So I was very lucky to end up where I, where I was. Um, at 16, uh, the inflammation had gone on for so long, just the, the non-diagnosis and, and the treatments that weren't being effective for so many years just led to such intense, irreparable inflammation that there was a portion of my bowel that was just, you know, a lost cause. And so I ended up having a bowel resection. Um, that bowel resection, a couple of days later in recovery, uh, the, at the anastomosis site where the two ends get put back together, where they were just not connecting. They were kind of rejecting each other. And I ended up getting a temporary colostomy bag, which at that age was just totally and utterly devastating. Um, and I was lucky enough to go back a few months later and have that colostomy reversed. Um, I am thankful for knowing that what that experience is, because in my lifetime, it may be something that I may have to revisit. Um, and I know what it is, and I know how to manage it. But you know, you can imagine that as a 16 year old, I felt like that was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. Um, after that surgery, I experienced a four and a half year remission, um, like total remission, not a sign of anything. And at that age, I kind of thought, oh, well, that's done with, that's behind me moving on. Um, at 21 years of age, uh, I got the wake up call that uh, this Crohn's disease was, was sticking around. Um, I had a second major flare up with major arthritis. Um, this time it hit my, my ankle and I ended up having to walk with a cane for a few months. Um, it was a, a really emotionally um, stressful time in my life, and that was the first time that I made the correlation of um, emotional stress and stress and my disease and how, um, you know, one could often trigger the other and the pattern kind of goes on in, in my history, which you'll see that, you know, at certain times in my life when, when my, in my body was stressed with life stress was when, uh, you know, the Crohn's would kind of rear its ugly head. Um, at that time, Remicade was kind of a new biologic on the market. It was in trial, and I got to be a part of that. And uh, unfortunately, though, it wasn't actually in trial. It was just finished its trial. It was on the market. I got on it, but I didn't have a medical plan at the time. I had no drug coverage. My family and I kind of scrambled together. It was quite costly just under $3,000 a month, and it was just not something that we could maintain. Um, so I, I actually did four treatments and unfortunately had to give it up, which is insane. So, um, you know, luckily that's not where we are now, but um, at the time that's what, that's what happened. So I ended up back on the usual oral medications and kind of trying to keep things consistently well. Um, at 23, another major flare-up. I had moved to Toronto. I was living on my own. Um, again, emotionally stressful time, and here comes Crohn's again. And at 24, I had uh, made a major diet change. <laughs> I tried going vegetarian, and I did not seek the help of a dietitian. and I kind of did it really extremely and all wrong, and I ended up developing a kidney stone just the combination of my Crohn's, um, malabsorption that was happening, a totally imbalanced diet, and kidney stones at the age of 24, what the heck, awful. Um, but, you know, it prepared me for childbirth later in life. <laughs> uh, at 26, fourth major flare-up, um, deep circumstantial depression. Um, just, you know, getting to that point in my life where it was just kind of year upon year of just dealing with this illness and trying to live my life, trying to ignore the fact that I had this disease, but not, not able to because it was just so prevalent. Um, I ended up having to move back to Vancouver, uh, just couldn't keep a job, um, and moved into my sister's basement. It was just a really kind of hard time, kind of bottomed out uh, at that point in my life. Um, was lucky enough to get a job uh, when I got back to Vancouver, a great one. Um, had a major arthritis flare-up at that time, just with the stress of the new job, but managed to get that under control fairly quickly. Um, fifth major flare-up, um, I had to take a 
medical leave of absence, which um, was the first time in my life that I'd actually taken advantage of, um, you know, what our medical system has to offer and um, luckily had a, a job that had extended medical and took some time to actually take care of myself. Um, and, you know, did get things somewhat under control in taking that time off and 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 focusing on self-care and alternative therapies in conjunction with my pharmaceuticals. Um, but again, at, at 31, had kind of my sixth major flare-up, um, and that was kind of it for me. <laughs> that was when things um, needed to change. So um, I got a new physician, um, had kind of a total attitude and lifestyle change, um, got on a new treatment. That's when Humira was um, being prescribed, and I was one of the lucky ones that responded well to it, um, and it led to remission. Um, at 36, I gave birth to my son, and I add this in my timeline because I remember over the years being told so many times that I probably would never be healthy enough for a long enough period of time to have a healthy pregnancy and have a child, and, um, you know, I knock on wood, I thank my lucky stars every day that I was able to find a treatment that worked for me um, and that I was healthy enough to, to do that and start a family. A real dream come true. So when the story is laid out like that, it seems like an unrelenting battle and it did feel like that at times. But things really changed for me when I turned 30 Perhaps it can be attributed to personal growth and maturity that develops around that time in life, but it was really a conscious decision to take control of my health once and for all, to commit to getting well and staying well. What I've learned in this journey that I feel is worth worthy of sharing, particularly with those who are facing the same challenges, is that you are your own primary caregiver. And if you aren't 100% invested in being well, nobody else will. Surrounding yourself with the best doctors who you feel can give you great care is essential. It is a very personal relationship, and I believe you have to find the right fit. I realize that that can be a challenge in our medical system, but it is something that I have insisted on and made happen through persistence and sheer stubborn will. Um, having a support system at home, at work, and in the community will help you work through the tougher times. You cannot do it alone, and those who love and care about you will be unfazed by the ugliness of it all. And keeping yourself as informed as possible about your disease and general health, attending evenings like this one, um, will give you the knowledge and tools you need to give yourself the best shot at a happy, healthy life. If you are an unhealthy person in general, your inflammatory bowel disease will only be worse for it. It sounds somewhat simple, but it definitely is not. It requires a lot of time and energy that can sometimes be hard to muster when dealing with chronic illness. But the payoff is worth it. I speak out a lot about my Crohn's disease because I think it's important for those who are suffering in silence and afraid to share, to feel like there's someone out there who understands what they are going through, to help others not to feel isolated the way that I did. And while I do commit some of my volunteer time to amazing organizations like the GI Society and others, the fact that I have Crohn's disease does not define me. Um, it is an aspect of my life that has taught me a lot. It has shaped me in many ways, but it does not consume me. For me personally, attitude is key. I do not allow myself to feel like I am an unfortunate victim in this, which can be really easy to feel in those kind of desperate times. Um, Everything in life is relative. Everyone has their challenges, big and small, and if I manage the negative things, I leave room to enjoy the positive things. In the time I have worked and volunteered in the Crohn's and colitis community, I have come across many parents who are devastated and terrified for their children who have been diagnosed with these diseases. And as a new mom, I completely get it. My number one fear in life is learning that I have passed on this awful disease to my son. But I tell myself the same thing I tell these parents. Having inflammatory bowel disease has not stopped me from living an amazing and fulfilling life so far. I have defied the limitations that this disease imposes. 
I have clocked over 50,000 kilometers in epic road trips with my best friend. I've worked in Africa. I've jumped out of a plane. I've seen paradise. I have felt the spirits in the St. Peter's Basilica. I've fallen in love. I've experienced a miracle. And I have the gift of a loving family. Life is good. I would like to thank the folks at the GI Society for inviting me to speak tonight and the folks at Vancouver Coastal Health for hosting this event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was uh, a wonderful testimony. Maybe our speakers could come up and we have time for some uh, questions. Um, we have microphones, but I'm I'm happy to uh, repeat the question. Gail, you want to? Well, Fergal, stand up. You stood. <laughs> Please, do any um, questions? Yes, ma'am, in front. So the question was uh, about probiotics, and particularly, are they useful after one's been on antibiotics for presumably whatever, a cold or urinary infection or something? Yeah. So I don't have to. Uh, this is all. I suspect we'll hear different answers from different people. Is that uh, hello. Yeah. yeah that's, that's all. So the question was, probiotics, should probiotics be used after you've been on some antibiotics? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm regretting putting that topic up, diet and probiotics. Um, I always say they could do no harm. Um, it's worthwhile. Is there definitive evidence? I don't know from, from my point of view, but they're, they're reasonably harmless. You know, the side effects, uh, major side effects from probiotics are minimal and they can potentially do no harm. So I don't see a reason why not. Ted, do you have a thoughts on probiotics after antibiotics? Um, or with C. diff perhaps too? Well, yeah, it's a different question. So there's some evidence in children in particular that take, taking probiotics with antibiotics can improve some of the diarrhea that kids often get, but it doesn't actually prevent C. diff in adults and kids C. diff is not really a problem. So um, I tell people that again, that it's only toxic to your bank account. Um, and if it makes you feel better, by all means continue it. Most people who come to me with multiple recurrences of C. diff have already tried them all and they haven't worked. And I say, you know, if you, if you don't mind paying for it and you like the way it makes you feel, by all means continue it. Uh, I don't think there's any harm in most people. They, um, the, the Infectious Disease Society guidelines don't recommend probiotics for C. difficile in particular because there's just no evidence and there are rare cases of people getting bloodstream infections from the probiotic strains but those are really rare and in, and in most people i just say if they make you feel better there's no how long should you it. take them as a if you're going to try them what's the fair length of time to to try them out i think about this long <laughs> or, or this much money or uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't think that there's. I, I like I said. I don't. I don't take them personally. I don't recommend them to people. But you know, I, I say to people if they're already taking them, if they ask, if you know, give it a try if you feel better. Um, but I don't think there's a, a particular, month or a week or. I, I have no idea. There's a doctor answer for you. <laughs> yeah. Another question, yes, ma'am. Uh, there you go. Eighty-seven with Crohn's. <laughs> So the question for Dr. Saul, I think, would be around arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease, and are they associated? I think you do find autoimmune disorders uh, that kind of occur more commonly in families uh, like that. Um, if you look at all the genetic uh, predispositions, there is overlap between chronic diseases such as Crohn's disease and sometimes with rheumatoid arthritis. And also an interesting area sometimes with the chronic infections like TB even, although not the overlap is not as great. 
So this is where that old theory of, you know, infectious agents comes in, you know, to play too. But absolutely. And if you look at the extraintestinal manifestations of IBD, it's usually arthritis that's usually top of the, you know, the, the common disorders. So maybe just to follow, the, the question came up about uh, passing it on. So you're asking about that, and Ms. Dave was talking about that. What are the risks of passing on inflammatory bowel disease to children or, or family members? So is that... So it's a question that comes up a lot. Is it really transmissible or, or hereditary? Well, you know, if you look at the data, it's, uh, if you have identical twins, the concordance rate is about 30%, 10% for UC, so it's much lower. So it's not like it's universal, but certainly there's an increased incidence. That's when you've got it exactly the same. Exactly. The, so, so even then, you know, if you're exposed to what well, should be the same bug, same diet, it's not as great. So there are other factors we don't understand. But there is some interesting new data that's come out recently indicating that bugs, you can actually get bugs from people around you. And this would explain why you see clusters in families too, where there isn't such a strong genetic uh, predisposition. And so, you know, I don't think we fully understand. So genes, environment, and uh, probably our diet all play a role. So what's your, what's your understanding, Ms. David, about your son? Do you think he's at risk then, or what's your feeling? I'm the only person in my family with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. We are immigrants, and I came at the age of three, and everyone else was significantly older. Uh, I have my own theories on that, but obviously environment seems to be a key factor in that story. So, yeah, genetic predisposition, of course. Um, whether it develops into the disease, I guess, is environmental. So there's a lot of unknowns, and hence the research. Did you have any thoughts about arthritis? Or she was talking about arthritis, and what was your experience with arthritis with your disease? You know, it's a, it's a chicken or the egg thing, because I actually recall having arthritic symptoms prior to acknowledging the bowel symptoms, but really not sure which came first. But I can tell you that every time I've had a flare of one or the other, the other one is present. So. That's how it manifests in me anyways. So there is that association with Absolutely. your arthritis in your, and do you find your treatment helps the um, arthritis symptoms? Absolutely. Yeah. The Humira has essentially cured me of all arthritic symptoms, which is a first in a long time. So the question was, how do you treat arthritis if you don't have Crohn's? It would, that's <laughs> all? Exactly the same way. So, so the same way you treat the arthritis in... Uh, so if you have bad arthritis, say rheumatoid arthritis, you would treat with methotrexate first, you know, after treating with painkillers. But in order to modify the disease, we're told, you use the same set of biologics. In fact, we've learned from the rheumatologists. The rheumatologists were the first people to show that the anti-TNFs were very, very useful in a setting of IBD. So we've kind of copied them all along the way, pretty much. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So the question to Ms. David was around uh, what lifestyle changes that she made that helped her and, uh, and what other non-medical things, you, yeah. non-pharmaceuticals that have been helpful. Well, the truth is that prior to this treatment, I was pretty inconsistent with my treatments. Um, in my 20s, I was a bit irresponsible about my disease and treating it well. Um, and so, you know, that's a big shift, just kind of that conscious choice to be responsible about my health, but also just general health, you know. Fitness, sleep, nutrition, general happiness and well-being. So, making life choices that were less that that were less causing less stress in my life in the long run um, definitely contribute to to the remission. I think for sure. Did you have any experience with support groups? A lot of people ask about support groups and sort of working with other people that have the similar problems. Did you find that helpful? Or and did I, you involve yourself with that? I actually didn't. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I've only really gotten really deeply involved in the community in the last seven or eight years. Um, volunteering. Uh, there's there. I know that Bad Gut has support groups, um, and Crohn's and Colitis Canada has um, 
chapters of people who who work together, and I, I find that the connection really does does help because there's a sharing of information. Um, that goes on that's not just the medical stuff, you know, some of the alternative things that do help kind of manage symptoms. So I think I think it can only help. Gail, did you have any thoughts about support groups uh, for the... Okay, so yeah. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, we do have an inflammatory bowel disease support group here in Vancouver. So if anybody's interested in that, we've got information at our table out there and uh, and online. For those who are tapping in online, uh, just go to badgut.org and search for support groups and you'll find them. So if you do want to engage in that, we do have long experience. We have newbies who attend the group and long time uh, experienced uh, IBD patients. It's not for everybody, but some people find that helpful. Is there any other questions at all? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, I can repeat it. I would get a, a hangnail and then I'm in, I'm in hospital and they're telling me I almost need my finger amputated 48 hours later. Like it just seems like my body, although I'm so superbly healthy on every level, literally, is not, um, like I know I'm not, like it's my immune, I don't have an immune system. So can we maybe, uh, maybe Dr. Saul, you could address that question about how long should you give, so her comment was about trying different treatments, how long should you give a uh, a new treatment or biologic, and what's the reality of how long does that treatment effect last for treatments? So, uh, maybe I didn't hear you. Um, do you have colitis or Crohn's? I have colitis. You have ulcerative colitis? Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, if we look at the data, if you already ex have been exposed to an anti-TNF, as a population, you don't seem to do as well as those who are biologic naive. We kind of realized that about most of the biologics. The new data with Stellara Ustakinumab seems to indicate it might be a good fit, but besides Antivio, all of these agents are immunosuppressive in some shape or form. Antivio is very gut specific. As you may recall, there was a lot of concern because it shares some properties with another drug called Seabri, which was used in multiple sclerosis and it caused that horrible brain condition. But so far, no signal with Antivio whatsoever. So I think uh, we should probably have this conversation six months from now, see how you've done on this agent. I suspect you won't get any more infections, but that's assuming that the rest of your immune system is okay, and all of this is related just to the biologics. So give it some time. So you should give these drugs about? Well, you know, normally we'd say give it uh, just the induction period. For most of them, that works out to be the three doses for, you know, the anti-TNFs, sorry, for Remicade, probably three months for Humira, and uh, for Vito, which is, or Antivio, which is used very similar to uh, Remicade or Infliximab, I would give it at least a period of four to six months. Six months for you because you've been exposed to it. Now, here's the other interesting uh, feature about Antivio is that if we look at the Crohn's disease data, they don't seem to do as well early on. You really need time to see the effects. So at a year out, the data looks quite promising, and I suspect beyond that it improves even more. So if you've tried everything else, given your immune background, I would just stick to it. So you should try it for a year or so? I think probably minimum of six, but please try it for a year. So no, I will, like I, all of them, I respond well, but it's like you choose, I choose my bowel or I choose my health. 
So, right, so it's just, I just always am kind of, and then I go off of it and then I get very sick. And so here we go again, right? So yeah. I just want to stay on, I'm looking at you going, I, I want seven years of remission. That looks really promising. So, and the sad fact and is, I'm, that, and I'm hopeful, yeah, I'm going to do it. We make antibodies to all of these drugs. That's the problem. So every time you kind of come off, you make antibodies, you lose the effect. But if we put you on immunosuppressives, then guess what? We start that whole cycle again. So, Dr. Steiner, do you have any thoughts about sort of protecting your immune system from uh, from other things, and maybe in particular C. diff? I guess is how do you skin infections or colds and things like that? Is there any thoughts on that? Well, the best way to protect your gel- yourself against C. diff is not to go on antibiotics. Um, nobody should be on antibiotics if they're not absolutely required. But it's something that we need to remind ourselves a lot. Um, People sometimes get put on them empirically for a sore throat that binder might not be strep, and or a dentists are using a lot. Um, naturopaths are allowed to prescribe antibiotics sometimes for very inappropriate indications. So, so avoiding antibiotics is a good idea. Obviously, in your case, that's not what what you've been dealing with. the The evidence of the safety of the biologics, most of it comes from uh, rheumatoid arthritis because they they have more patients and more experience. And what it suggests is that the the risk of serious infections is front loaded. So it's highest in the first six months. And then after a year, it actually drops down to baseline. And in people with rheumatoid arthritis, by the end of two or three years, their risk of infection is actually lower than not being on the biologic because rheumatoid arthritis itself can predispose you to infection. In IBD, it's a little bit different and and the, but the safety signal is still really good. But it's all based on averages. So absolutely, you know, we see people with bad infections that they wouldn't otherwise get. Um, But if you're someone who's contemplating, you know, whose doctor's recommending a biologic and you're afraid of it because the infection risk, I usually say that the the infection risk is is it is not zero, but it's it's manageable. Um, And in fact, some of the older drugs that we use like Imuran and 6MP and methotrexate um, carry very high infection risks also, but different infections, a lot of viral infections like shingles. So um, there's nothing in medicine that's free, unfortunately. Um, Are there any protective vaccinations that people should have before they take uh, uh, biologics or? um, yeah, that's a really good question, um, and it's a it's an area of some controversy. Um, you certainly should be up to date on your regular vaccines. Um, what, what are my regular? Well, any childhood vaccines that you haven't had. Uh, so that's you wanna, mumps, measles, rubella. Yeah, mu- some, measles, mumps. Bunch of mumps around right now. Somewhere. There is. There's a mumps outbreak right now. So, um, but that's for everybody. Um, you know, tetanus vaccine every ten years. So, um, but the the I think the most controversial one is the shingles vaccine because it is a live vaccine. So you're not supposed to receive that if you're immunosuppressed at all. Um, although a number of fairly good studies have come out suggesting that it's completely safe, yet there's still this black box warning. So, so we don't do it. So I think if you're not currently on any sort of immunosuppressive agent, um, certainly if you're over 50, I think sh- the shingles vaccine is a good idea. Um, it hasn't been studied in younger folks, but I think shingles is, is probably the biggest vaccine preventable um, or partially preventable issue that we see. Another thing that comes up is if you're traveling somewhere where there's yellow fever, like Africa or the Amazon, um, that's another vaccine that you shouldn't get if you're immunosuppressed. So, um, uh, but otherwise, I don't know what the recommendation, flu vaccines every year are safe and we recommend those. And then the pneumonia vaccine, if you have a reason to get it, um, is a safe vaccine also. And how often should that be repeated? The pneumovax, uh, I think it's every 10 years, but it's only for people with certain specific indications, um, at least in adults. We're giving it to, to babies now. Yeah. I would add hepatitis A, B, and probably Thank the chicken you. pox yeah. uh, to that. Uh, mix. So there's good hepatitis vaccinations for yeah. A and B and yeah. chicken pox. And, yeah. uh, Dr. Donald, do you have any thoughts about the di- dietary support for don't roll your eyes. Like no, that. no, I'm not. No, no, I'm <laughs> waiting for the question. Uh, that was a question. Just is there any dietitian dietary sub- things that would be helpful for protection against infections and and well-being? And oh, that's a difficult question. I think uh, uh, well, but yeah. Thanks, Dr. Gray. <laughs> I'm not, not going to turn up to this meeting again. Um, you know, I think a well-balanced diet is the main thing, rather than anything specific. And again, these these. Uh, not the so-called fad diets, because the low FODMAPs is actually a, a medical diet, so devised by a gastroenterologist in Australia and a dietitian combined. Um, but a lot of these diets, that uh, a lot of these are elimination and restrictive diets. Um, so I don't particularly advise 
any of these elimination diets at a time when you're on things like Remicade, Humira, and Tibio. And if if one is going to um, to trial these, it's best to do it with with the dietitian. So you support seeing seeing a professional dietitian? Absolutely, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And we have some professional dietitians in the audience here. Wave your hands. There you go. <laughs> Um, any Please other don't disregard everything I said on my yeah. slides. <laughs> any other questions here? Well, here we go. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, this is something that's been occurring more and more for me as I age, I've had Crohn's for over 30 years, and uh, my symptoms would always be the, you know, typical running to the bathroom, and, uh, you know, if I was really sick 30 times a day, and um, and I'm always asked, well, how many bowel movements are you having a day? Well, well now, I, I have really slow motility, so that I... I go for long periods of time without having a bowel movement, um, without passing gas. Um, is that something that is normally happens to people as we age with Crohn's? So the question is really around how frequent should you go? And maybe we should say in... We won't do a poll of the audience here, but what's a normal... <laughs> okay, everybody. What's a, what's a normal bowel pattern? And then we'll talk about what's an abnormal bowel. What's, what's normal? I, I don't know. What's normal for you? <laughs> You're probably a once a day, seven show a.m. You mine, show me yours. So, so, <laughs> I, I, I think the important thing is um, change. So if, Has something changed and has it changed recently? I think if if your bowel movements have slowed down, because the worst thing is is there something else going on in your in your bowels. If this is something that has changed two or three years ago, and you're now you were once a day, and now you're once every three days, um, I don't think there's anything serious going on. It's probably not a good thing if. Um, if, if your bowels have slowed down and you're beginning to strain or have problems with actually emptying your bowels because that can lead to fissures, hemorrhoids, things like that. Um, yep. So sort of the comfort of the passing of the stool is part of the normal. Yeah, it's, it is important. It's um, not the frequency so much as the... Yeah, I, I, I think it, it is. It's how, when did the change happen? If it's been going on for some time, then I don't think there's anything serious. If it has been going on very recently, if there's been a change in bowel habit, then it's something you do, should discuss with your family doctor, your gastroenterologist. But uh, if you're not going once every three, you know, three or four days, and you're ending up straining, difficulty passing, you you lead to other problems. No, it's it's going like more like a week. And, yeah, and just no, no, no noise, nothing going on, and. During, yeah, it's, during it, that time, my appetite just decreases and decreases and decreases as well. No, just absolutely. So no you, you must remember that there are more Canadians that suffer with constipation than there are diabetic diabetics <laughs> in Canada. Uh, so the common things of constipation, and are we like to talk about constipation. This is more your area, Doctor. We have pamphlets on constipation. Doctor Saul, you want to say something? I see. No, I'm just sitting forward in my chair. Oh, I thought you were I was listening intently. Oh. <laughs> I, I think, um, as Dr. Donlan has said, I mean, you have to dissociate it from the Crohn's too. You have to look at it separately and not just say it's all related to the Crohn's. So treat it as, okay, bowels are slowing down. What could it be? So discuss it with your family physician. Is it something metabolic, endocrine? Is it something related to the Crohn's, unrelated? So a number of things have to be looked and, at. And the most likely would be a dietary change. Would be quite yeah, I was, your, your I was expecting really to say, eat, try more fiber and fluids. And yeah. I was there's a diet. Okay, sorry. No, 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 oh, you go ahead. Oh, I want to hear your take on fiber. No, no, no. Inopportune. I, I actually know what I'd say on fiber, so I want to get some pointers from you. That is something that I, that I have been, been doing. doing, increasing fiber more and more over the last few months. Um, and trying to put um, other foods back in my diet that haven't been there for a while. So definitely getting fiber, definitely keeping my fluids up. It's, it's, uh, 
even think, even if I take something that's supposed to be for constipation, it doesn't move any. Nothing changes. I just get well, we're, more we're very We have uh, one of the writers of the Canadian guidelines on constipation with us, Dr. Gray. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I mean, a lot of it's around what what the constipation is associated with. So, I mean, constipation with associated with a lot of cramping and pain may suggest there's an element of obstruction, which can be a feature as was shown in Gail's video of Crohn's disease, you get obstruction, but usually there'd be a lot of pain with it. So in the absence of pain, and just because the bowel slows down, that is not necessarily an ominous problem. And it may be reflecting uh, dietary change. It may reflect hormonal changes, uh, emotional changes, uh, fluid intake uh, changes, and medications can affect the bowel. So a lot of things can be not a significant don't necessarily reflect a significant problem within the GI tract. If you're starting getting pain with cramping and vomiting, that would suggest there's a bowel obstruction, but that's usually fairly dramatic, and that could be a feature of Crohn's disease. Yes, ma'am, you want to say something? But you're not old, so... <laughs> and neither am I. Yes. <laughs> Pe people really know bowel obstructions. You don't keep it a secret. You know about bowel obstructions. There are no, and Ms. David, you can tell us about bowel obstructions or? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say that I think we've all had it for that long. You've had Crohn's or colitis for that long. You've had an obstruction at one point. <laughs> and it's dramatic, huh? Yeah, it's, it's, it's dramatic and you're hospitalized and you're doubled over in pain. And so it's, yeah, this obviously is not it, yeah. Yeah. I know what that feels like, and this is this is just like nothing happening. Well, and it, you, after a while, you start to feel toxic, right? Like, well, the bowel has its own kind of brain, its own muscle rhythm, and, and it well, sometimes. Well, my brain's not working. Well, the bowel brain is different. Yeah, I, I see people are moving. Any other questions in the audience here? Which was, of what? So the question was around retinoic acid, which is used for treatment of acne and its role in... Uh, and uh, big lawsuits and... Uh, so do, can you summarize that for Dr. Saul, the role of the, the risks of retinoic acid used for acne and... and I think either... If you look at the data, there's no kind of causal association. And uh, so I often see patients who come in and uh, a striking example was uh, a mother's son who came in and the son clearly has got big time acne, he's got colitis and he wants something done about it. He's going to University of Southern California and he wants to look great. So mom's saying, no, you're not taking it. Son's saying, I'm taking it. So he goes down south, comes back six months later, Christmas or whatever, his acne have all magically disappeared. And I asked him, what about your colitis? didn't bother it one bit. That's anecdotal, but I think if you look at the data overall, there is no association. So I usually tell my patients it's safe to, but data is data. We don't, you know, at the moment when we randomize patients, we don't have any genetic or other markers to randomize them with. So if you happen to be one of those individuals, you know, that are going to react to it, you're going to react. So I think that's the problem at the moment. The data aren't huge. It's a collection of studies and sort of case series. So so a lot of it's around listening to your own body, and if you're taking a new medication, you get constipated, you get, you have to recognize that medications can do things that aren't really known, but I think there's a lot of evolving literature on that <laughs> retinoic acid question. Any other questions at all? Or? Well, thank you very much for your attention. I think I want to thank um, AbbVie, who makes Humera, and they sponsored uh, this evening. I want to thank very much the Vancouver Coastal Health The Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute for organizing this. Thank our speakers for coming and sharing their experience. Yeah. And Gail wants to say something.
Well, since I didn't get to sit up there, I get to hold the mic and stand here. Yeah. I just want to let everybody know, if you don't already know, tomorrow is World IBD Day, and we're going to be doing a lot on social media, and I encourage you to follow us at GI Society uh, and, and tweet stuff about IBD tomorrow. Let's raise some awareness. Let's get that going out there, and let's get the keep the dialogue going. So please, it's really timely that we're here tonight, and then we tomorrow we can start off fresh and follow us. Carl's going to be doing some social media for us tomorrow on this, so please stay tuned to that. And, and while you're on the website, again, those surveys are of interest and, and helpful for you. And finally, I want to thank all of you for coming and uh, sharing your experiences and, and for attending and for your attention to this. And so thank you all very much for coming and I hope you have a pleasant evening if you can find your car. <laughs>